Uh, I have a very, very elite panel of um, speakers and thinkers and uh, doers and makers, if I can say, and writers. <laughs> uh, so let me introduce them very, very rapidly, and then we dive into the theme and the topics. Um, Ashok Adicm, if I'm pronouncing it correct, um, he's uh, the the, the French government counselor for One Planet Summit for the Ocean and the U.S. Ocean Conferences 2025, UN, UN. yes. <laughs> uh, Bertrand Baudre, uh, he's the managing director and founder of Blue Like and Orange Sustainable Capital and former CFO of the World Bank Group. Uh, Genev uh, Nathalie Bestinelli is the founder of We Belong to Change, uh, former head of Harvest China and an author with a recent book that I'm sure she will put sh shed some light on rather than heat. But, uh, and then Genevieve uh, Ferron, uh, she's the author of Pioneer of Socially Responsible Investment, CEO Kasebe, uh, co-founder of Profil, vice president of the Shift Project. Then we have Sel Kofiga from Ghana. Uh, he is a multifaceted artist uh, uh, from the, sum, the Slum Studio, the Fashion Waste Recycling Project. And then we have Reina Ma Maruyama. I'm sorry if I pronounced it incorrectly. She is the Chief Sustainability Officer of Work Studio Panico, which is also one of the, uh, the title um, you know, sponsors or, uh, you know, important part of the this event. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining in today. Um, when I had this theme, I was saying, okay, what do we talk about sustainability? There are so many themes around sustainability. So, and we have so many speakers with different perspectives and views and background. Uh, so let's have a little bit of, um, you know, insights into what exactly are we doing with sustainability in terms of, you know, moving above and beyond just, uh, you know, talking the talk to walking the talk, right? So uh, I'll, I'll start with, right ahead with Bertrand, since you came the, le the last, so we'll start you with the first. Uh, maybe you can give some insights, uh, uh, you know, uh, starting insights, and then we can go around, and then we can further dive in. Okay, well, thank you, thank you very much. It's uh, always great to be at the Bernardin. I have many, many connections with this place over the years. Not the first time I'm on this stage to discuss that topic, so it's always uh, extremely moving. I think it's, uh, you chose the right title. That's a question that everybody is asking today. Are we serious about all this or not? And I think it's important to raise this question at a moment where sustainability is being challenged, both uh, politically, a number of voices which are now uh, saying this is just nonsense, woke, etc. We've, we've heard and read this everywhere and there are growing criticism uh, or fatigue. Uh, and it's also challenging economically at a moment where uh, inflation is rising. Uh, and, and I mean, what we are discussing is somewhat inflationary, so we, ca we cannot ignore that. At a moment where interest rates are rising, so money is no longer magic and free. So we probably have missed the opportunity when it was magic and free. So at, at all these things, do we really want to pay the price for changing our systems? That, that's the reality. Uh, ju just a reminder to start with, seven years ago, we committed, I mean, as far as I know, it's still a, a UN document, uh, which has, I mean, several UN documents which have been signed by all governments, uh, including the US, which have been back in, 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 the, uh, in the climate agreement, but also the Sustainable Development Goals agreed in, in, the, in the UN in September 2015 and the Paris Accord and followed by, by all the subsequent COP uh, in December. So we are committed. We are committed. So we should not discuss, because at the end of the day, we made the decision to go in that direction. The problem is that at that time, we have not been really digging into the real issue. It's easy to agree on an objective. It's more difficult to agree on the ways and means to get there. And we did not really raise the question of money. We did not really raise the question of the system. We kind of believed that the invisible end would find its way. And that if we agree on objectives, the market will, will, will do it. And, and so we thought we'll start with some pioneers and then the crowd will follow. And it will be a natural move. And that's why I don't like the way transition. Transition is nice and smooth. You transition from one side of the beach to the other. Uh, and, and as we said, it's one or two percent of the money changed uh, every year. It's one or two percent of the effort done every year. And when you say that to people, it's nothing. But in reality, it's something. We've tested with the COVID that true percentage point is a lot, actually. And, and that's precisely the point that we, we're realizing today. So of course, seven years later, 2022, uh, after pandemics, with a war context, 
we are not there, I mean, to say the least. Uh, I think we missed, as I said, seven years of magic money. Uh, so we did not really start with this free money. Uh, I think we did not really build on what was left of the multilateralism uh, framework that, that we knew. I think the last happy end was the handshake between Barack Obama and Xi Jinping in, uh, in the fall 2015. Uh, we thought it was the beginning of a new era. I think at the end it was the end of the previous era. It was the end of the end of history. Uh, and today, we are still very much in the system that we've known forever, which I would call the Friedmanian system. The social purpose of business is to make profit. That's what is irrigating the accounting system, the prudential system, the compensation system, the governance, the fiduciary duties, etc. So that's pretty much where we are. So we still have the objectives, but we have not touched the system, and we did not really address the question how to get there. And that's, that's really the big issue. On top of that, we are facing a, a more challenging environment uh, with, uh, with growing social tension including in this country, as you might have noticed. And uh, so in, in total, uh, I think the root causes of uh, the inefficiencies have not been addressed. Uh, selfishness is on the rise. Uh, multilateralism is as dysfunctional as ever. Inequalities are growing, digital tensions everywhere, and there are growing incomprehensions on sustainability. Let's take the example of Africa. Two years ago, or one year ago, you told Africa, don't look for natural gas, it's bad, it's fossil fuel. And now, apparently, we have a gas problem, so we go back to Africa and say, guys, why don't you expedite natural gas? I mean, what do you want people to tell, to think about this, etc.? So that's precisely the point. Uh, and you remember, maybe uh, at the beginning of the COVID, people say, what is the world after? And the French writer Michel Houellebecq said, don't rush too much on the world after, it's the world before, but worse. And that's, that's probably something we need to meditate today. So we've done some marginal moves. I mean, I don't want to say that we've done nothing, uh, but we are not really serious. And now we understand that it's tough, that it's not just a transition, it's a transformation of our production, of our consumption, of our finance. It's really a change of the operating system. It can no longer be profit for itself as an end to an end. It's, uh, as Colin Meyer from Oxford say, the social purpose of business is not to increase profits, it's to find profitable solution to the problem of this planet and its people. And that's pre precisely what we have to do, and that's what we have not really started to do. So we are uh, at a moment where it's time to open the hood, uh, it's time to take our toolbox, it's not fun. I mean, nobody is excited at the idea of spending hours to discuss accounting standards. Uh, it's long. There are a lot of vested interests, a lot of people would like to manipulate the system to their profit. I mean, Geneviève knows about it. Uh, and so we are facing a number of questions. First, what do we want to measure? I mean, the quantities. I mean, everybody kind of agree on CO2, but there are many other quantities that we have not yet agreed on. And then do we want to put a value on these quantities, positive or negative? These are very tough questions. And so uh, the, the real other question is that there is no master of the world that will decide for us. That's a big difference with the 1970s or 80s when you had the consensus of Washington. You had the big guy telling you this is the way to do it. You don't like it, you don't like it. That doesn't matter. Today you have Europe, you have the US, you have China, you have a number of countries. And, uh, and so the substitute to, to this big change is ESG. So we have ESG everywhere. So we say it's a 40, 50, 100 trillion. I mean, nobody knows what a trillion is actually, but so a lot of money apparently is driven by environmental, social or governance purpose. Uh, the truth is that it's still very confusing. Uh, the, the economist, for those of you who read The Economist over the summer, says these three letters ESG won't save the world. Uh, it's still very much aspirational. There are probably 150 to 200 ESG frameworks, so you pick the one you like. And then, like Texas, you say, I don't want to work with you because you're too much focused on, on, on climate. Actually, Florida did the same yesterday. And uh, in an opposite manner, California says, if you are not ESG enough, I don't want to work with you. So that's really where we are. <laughs> Oh, sorry, ESG means the taking into account of environmental, social, and governance issue. And this, these are the, the, the three letters that are being used for uh, money managers, etc. to say, I put your money in an ESG box because I will take care of the planet with that. I mean, that's, and apparently there are trillions and trillions of, maybe your money is in ESG, I don't know. Apparently not, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so we, we have this ESG framework uh, with a lot of risk, actually, and, uh, and we're confronted to that. One risk is bureaucracy. 
you, you, you create a bureaucratic monster, uh, which people lose the sight of the purpose. Uh, one, thing, one risk is a cost, one, one risk is a fragmentation. You have a European for, uh, ESG framework, a Chinese uh, ESG framework, an American ESG framework, or whatever. Uh, and the reality is also the lack of inclusiveness, because the big, big people which are not represented around the table, namely South America, Asia, and Africa, have no word into that. So they, when we need natural gas, we say natural gas is okay. When we don't need it, say it's, it's bad. Um, and that's why I think Asia society is right to focus on that. I think Asia has a particular role. It's, it's, a, difficult, um, it's a difficult role because Asia is, is part of the problem as well, let's face it. Uh, there are a number of tensions and contradictions there. So I don't want to be too long at that stage and I prepare some, some principles I'd like to share with you. I keep them for the conversation. But I, I really want to, in, to conclude that I think we are at a very timely moment. We should not fool ourselves. We have not started to cross the beach. Uh, so we have done a number of things. Uh, even I, I saw that ESG would be known by everybody. Thank you for reminding us it's not done. So even that is not done. So okay, the rest is, is, is far away. So that's really the moment where we are today. We are at a very important moment. Do we continue to move forward? Or do we just say, well, enough, and we, we wait? And, and that's really where uh, the title is right. I hope we are not sleepwalking into a disaster. Thank you, Bertrand. I mean, I see that you're wearing this SDG kind of uh, yeah. batch. So, kind again, of. one <laughs> one of the SDGs is about maritime, right? Uh, and sea and marine time, uh, you know, ecology and, and, and what's the impact on that. And I think Ashok is an authority on that. Uh, would you like to discuss that? Yes, so I won't, I won't speak as a bureaucrat because you, when you said bureaucrat, you looked at me. No, I, I, mentioned, <laughs> I, I mentioned the UN. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and and to 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 in response to what you said just now, said Moit, the the uh, SDG 17 is the one which takes care of uh, the ocean. The way we are working with uh, Ambassador Olivier Poirot d'Arvor, who is the special envoy of President Macron for the ocean, uh, is something I'm going to discuss here to see how actually the ocean fits into this nexus uh, climate, biodiversity, and ocean, and how this converges uh, towards the SDGs in, in general. Uh, I hope not to be stratospheric nor a bureaucrat. But just say two things, uh, three maybe. Uh, my legitimacy here is uh, all because uh, of uh, uh, Valérie Terranova. I'm, I'm not sure she's still around, but uh, Valérie appointed me, that was like 15 years ago, as Secretaire General de l'année la, de, de la Francophonie, General Secretary of uh, the Francophone um, Year in France. Uh, I was already working actually for the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, my second legitimacy maybe is because I spent some time in China and Ambassador Axel Cruyau here was uh, my authority, but I was working in the private sector. I was directing a museum there. So I had a little experience in China. I was very happy to hear actually of all what was, has been said. Maybe the third thing is because I'm born in India. I'm, 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 I'm born in Delhi, although I'm French. Uh, and uh, Valérie caught me at the moment just in between two missions. So I finished my first mission, which was the One Ocean Summit in Brest at the initiative of President Macron that we organized with uh, 100 countries represented, with uh, 41 heads of states who committed uh, very strongly into 17 uh, we called Brest commitments that with uh, Ambassador Poir d'Arvor, with the Quai d'Orsay and other ministries, uh, we carried through words, uh, I mean, from Brest to Lisbon till the UN Ocean Conference, uh, which was in Lisbon. And our president, Macron, uh, decided with the president of Costa Rica uh, to co-host the next UN Ocean Conference, which will be in France in 2025. Um, before entering into maybe uh, details and the program of what we wanted to develop uh, during this year, which we think, and is definitely, as you are saying, the situation for the ocean is, like for the climate, in a catastrophic state. Uh, the, the ocean is in a very bad state. Uh, but we thought with the UN, with our partners of the UN, with our partners of different countries, creating or consolidating high ambition coalitions of countries uh, that we had to act in this year 2022. So we had some steps which would take us next month actually to Egypt, where there's the, the next COP27, and then to Montreal, the Chinese biodiversity, Chinese presided biodiversity COP, which will be in, 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 in Canada. So things are happening. 
commitments are happening. Countries are joining forces uh, in different sectors, including the ocean, which is only 70.8% of the planet and which makes our planet a blue planet. Uh, and our work, and I'm happy to, 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 to be sitting next to Bertrand, and Bertrand was uh, uh, in, in one of the, the, the workshops in, in Brest. Our, our, our job is to really infiltrate uh, discussions and think tanks, but also uh, bring the heads of states and of governments uh, to the table of negotiations for uh, protecting the ocean and also developing with actors uh, uh, like, like, like Bertrand, with financiers, with, with uh, eco-entrepreneurs, uh, a blue sustainable economy. Uh, I've not prepared any notes, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to discuss about what we have done and what we have in the program uh, later on, uh, on the, the ocean, how this ocean is also an opportunity one ocean is an opportunity f to defend and promote multilateralism. I think it's, it's an opportunity for different countries, really, because even if you don't have a, a littoral, uh, you are concerned by, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, the ocean, the resources of the ocean, and actually uh, how the ocean impacts uh, climate change and how the ocean can be a solution also for climate change. The 45% of the uh, CO2 emitted is... Uh, uh, captured, thank you, uh, by, by, by the ocean. So we, we need to work with the ocean, work on nature-based uh, solutions. But just before uh, maybe transitioning into uh, another fellow, fellow speaker, I just wanted to, to read just two statistics. Researchers from British, American, and Finnish universities, uh, they funded the climate NGO Avaz, and they interviewed 10,000 young people aged 16 to 25 from a dozen different countries without telling them what the study was about. The result is 45% of them, 45% of them from 16 to 25 uh, said uh, that uh, they had this echo anxiety which uh, manifests itself in the ability to cope or not to cope with everyday life. 45% of the youth actually don't have any more Hope. Uh, there's, another, there's another study of IFOP, which is the French uh, survey uh, organization, did for, for CARE. Uh, and that study showed that in France, 71% of the 15, 17 uh, year old are afraid of the future. And a study conducted in 10 countries shows that 45% of French young people suffer from echo anxiety as well. Uh, so that gives us an immense responsibility in every occasion that we have, and this is one of it. Uh, and I uh, really uh, thank the uh, Asia Society and this great launch of Asia Society in France to uh, bring into the conversation sustainability, uh, to speak uh, very frankly of what we are doing, but also I think to raise uh, through that responsibility the level of of hope, the level of uh, ambition that uh, when we join people, countries, actors, multi-sector, uh, polycentric, as Pas Pascal Lamy would say, together, making use of the International Forum, uh, Europe, I think, and the EU is, is one of them, uh, we can really still do something uh, in the different forums of international uh, commitments, like the COP, to at least, uh, I won't say save the world, but conserve what we can still conserve. But what I'm saying, uh, uh, quoting the statistics for the youth, is our responsibility is immense uh, for this generation, this coming generation. 45% of them have lost total hope. Thank you, Ashok, well put. And I think there's a quote, I think, in Kenya or Africa, correct me if I'm wrong, there's a saying, the planet is not given to you by your parents, but lend it to you on rent by your grandchildren. So I think it absolutely resonates with how the, the future generation is so anxious about it. And moving from, uh, you know, sustainability in marine time to, you know, circular uh, economy, and in particular in fashion, I think, Reina, could you just give your insights and thoughts? I think it's, it's already there, you need to. Uh Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Reina, and I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer for uh, Work Studio Panaco. Um, thanks so much for inviting today. Um, I'm very happy to be uh, joining the roundtable uh, 
with the top experts today. Um, today, I want to share from uh, two points. One is from the business point of view, and second of all, from the cultural point of view. Um, I want to start from the cultural point of view that uh, in order to really walk the talk, I, I believe that uh, we all, the government, the business and finance, we all really need to really sit closely and talk because um, actually it, we, we already know that the current system doesn't work anymore. And uh, to make it a circular, circular economy, um, we have to rethink and redefine what is the system and what works and what doesn't work. And so we have to find out the solution together, not in just one way and uh, one from sector. And uh, the reason why I come to think of it is that uh, I need to explain a little bit about my company. Um, um, we we make a, we create uh, these boards. Actually, we aim to uh, achieve circular economy, especially in the fashion industry. Um, this board is made of 91.5% uh, wasted clothing, and uh, this this can be used as a furniture um, or displays um, or yeah any any board like. A, anything that you can think of and after using it you don't need to you don't need to throw it away we can collect it and we can upcycle everything and then make make it into new board again so we have a circular model already and um, why we came up with this uh, uh, this product is that uh, because we are a group of uh, uh, t uh, our employees is like uh, 10, 10 designers, and uh, we usually design displays for clothing brands. And we um, and when we work together, we knew that there was a problem of uh, overproduction. And that was, uh, it really hurt to see that from, from uh, our perspectives. And also when we create uh, displays and pop-ups, actually we use the uh, wooden boards. So that means uh, every time we have a promotion and uh, we, we create uh, one display, after two, three weeks, we just destroy it and then we just throw it away. So we have, we've seen from different perspectives um, that there's a lot of waste coming in just with only our business. And uh, so we decided to make these problems put in one solution, which is to, uh, which is to make this board um, using clothing. So that was a very good solution for us. And uh, so this one pinnacle board, actually this is uh, changed into like little, uh, little boards right now, but one standard board is made of uh, um, around 20 t-shirts. And uh, so by using pinnacle t uh, by using pinnacle board, that means that we can decrease waste actually, and we are already part of the circular system. And also um, another great benefit is that uh, by using pinnacle, we can uh, we don't need to cut down the trees um, in order to make boards. Let's say, for example. So there's uh, multiple benefits by using this board. So this is a good solution for us that uh, we want to make it bigger. And uh, so far, we started this project, and we're just ten small, uh, ten let's say employees, and we're not a, a professional in the sustainability uh, field. But with ten people, we uh, so far we upcycled 50 tons of clothing, and with ten people, we can do this. That means that when when 100 people gather or 1,000 people gather, then that makes a very big difference in my eyes. And so that's why. Um, to make this business work, or let's say this circular uh, business model work, we need to really talk with the government because we don't know how the legislation or uh, it works. So we need everyone's help and also the financing we really need. So this is why I really think that uh, we need to, yeah, this is my point of view. And uh, one more thing I want to talk about because today is the opening of the Asian society, is the cultural point of view. Um, I'm coming from Japan, and uh, also I live in uh, Germany. And I've seen um, that EU has been really leading the sustainability, and that really impresses me. But uh, when I when I when I see Japan, actually, I I feel a little bit worried. And for example, um, uh, the ESG investment ratio in EU was uh, when the EU had already like more than 50 percent, Japan had only three percent. 
And when you compare these numbers, I was like, oh, oh, okay, well, uh, we have to do something, but uh, we're, we're just getting really behind. But uh, the more I come to think of it, actually, and when I look into uh, history and culture of Japan, uh, more than 100 years ago in Edo era, we had a perfect sustainable circular system. And uh, we have just forgotten about it. So I think when we, when we want to make a circular economy, or make, a, make the um, society sustainable, we can also look into uh, um, the past and history, and we will find lots of green ideas, is Thank my you. point. Thank you. Thank you, Rina. I think it's a very interesting idea. I mean, one point that you said is about overconsumption, you know, and that's one of the reasons. And the other issue is about also how do you scale up, you know? Small is beautiful, large is necessary, right? So that's very, very important. So moving from, you know, uh, overconsumption to Natalie, conscious consumption, that's what you've been working on, and she came up with the book. So probably you can talk a little bit about on that perspective. Yes, so um, thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. And me, I'm supposed to speak about uh, maybe Chinese conscious consumption. Why, as a non-Chinese, I will talk about China? It's because I used to live there for five years. I was expatriated, and I created an NGO called We Belong to, to Change. And uh, the, um, my NGO was focusing on organizing annually an event in Beijing and in Shanghai. And I was promoting sustainable innovation, sustainable actions coming from all over the world and from China. And we were uh, released the event on the social networks with uh, more or less more than 4 million views with no promotion, no communication, because, you know, the budget is still an issue for the an NGO. And during the lockdown, when I was before the lockdown, when I was doing conferences here in France and sharing what China was, how they were involved to, to commit and to protect the planet, people were so shocked to say, no, China is the most polluting country and the most polluted country. Uh, and for the people behind the world, China, there is only the government. But they forget that there are people, you know, people who are committed, entrepreneurs, NGOs, and, and even consumers. And me, during the lockdown, I decided to share the stories that, that I could, uh, that I lived during my events. And so my book is, uh, it's in French right now, it's called As China Goes Green, but it's really a testimony on the so civil society committed to the planet. But for the first chapter, of course, I put the context and I'm explaining the measures of the government and I think that's why I'm here today, to give you some figures about how China is going green. So first thing that last year, I think the President Xi uh, really surprised the international community by announcing the plan 3060. That means that the China will reach the peak CO2 emission before 2030, and they will reach the uh, neutrality carbon uh, by 2060, just to compare Europe uh, is committed uh, uh, for 2050. So they launched a huge plan of measures um, starting in uh, 2013. I don't know if some of you have heard about the, this terrible period in China called the Airpocalypse. And this word was given by the Chinese media. Uh, it's when one was a toxic fog. Uh, invaded the whole the north of China, including the capital, and it lasted for three weeks. It was really terrible. And then after this period, uh, there was a real shock among the government, but also mainly among the population that were very uh, worried, but still angry. And that's why I started a lot of measures. So I'm going to give you an example, some examples, some figures. China is now investing more than one billion uh, dollars per year in uh, low carbon uh, energies. So they have, in, for solar plants, for example, they have increased by 70% 70, 70 every year. Uh, they are now leading this market. It's the same for the wind energy. Uh, they are uh, that now China represents 40% of the world market. They have also invested in hydroelectricity. In 1949, they had uh, uh, 22 dams. Uh, today, it's 22,000 dams, and we all know about the unfortunate uh, Three Gorge Dam, and we know that there are damages about hydroelectricity, but this is just to show you where China is going now. And about the nuclear power, 
Shana is number three behind the United States that has around uh, 100 plants. Behind France, who has 58 plants, even if some of them uh, are, shut down, are currently shut down. And uh, China plans to build six to eight uh, nuclear plants for the next 15 years. That means that the plant that uh, nuclear power can be represent 10% of the electricity compared to 5% right now. And when we all know that in France, it's 70%. So when you know the population and you compare between France and uh, China, maybe we can better accept that uh, this vision to build more nuclear plants. Also, they have launched a carbon market last year. It will be probably soon the biggest carbon uh, market in the world. They have tested it for eight years in the seven uh, richest and more industrial regions of the country, and they were very inspired by the European model. Um, now, of course, uh, the price of the ton is very low, $7 compared to 35 uh, in Europe. But still, it's still some, uh, you know, uh, some measures that show that how China is moving forward. And um, what can I also say? They took also some uh, um, measure for the companies. Uh, some big, all the big companies have now the obligation to publish their CO2 emissions. If because of the company there is some pollution damages, now the fines are very big compared to before, and also they risk the jail. But not only one person risks the jail, because in China it was very easy to choose one person and just, you know, you put it in jail. And uh, now it's all the management who uh, go to the trial, but also the official of the Communist Party who is judged and go to jail. So this is a big, it was a big shock in uh, civil society and even for the Chinese ecologists when the, the, this measure was uh, announced because they were very surprised that it could go so far. Um, what I could share with you is um, regarding the Chinese um, officials, uh, up to now they have two key objectives. It was uh, economic growth, and the uh, social stability. Now there is a third one, which is as much important as the two others, is to reach the environmental objectives. So we can, I'm not going to through all the details and um, to explain uh, how it, uh, it has been put in place, but it gives you uh, an idea of all the measures who are taken now by the government. And uh, I can give you another example for the automot automotive sectors, for example. Now you have, um, the, the government wants to reach half of his market should be uh, low carbon by 2030. So how do they took this in place? The, for example, in Beijing, you cannot buy a petrol car. Uh, you have to buy your lottery ticket. And then if you win, then you can have a petrol car. In Shanghai, it's a different uh, way. You, um, there is some taxis who double the price of the car. And uh, at, during the last international uh, motor show in Shanghai, which is the biggest in the world, you had six, more than 600 of the 1,000 exhibited models who were electric. And the first mini car city was around 3,500 euros. So there is really a push of the, um, of the government, meaning that for the manufacturers, either they are local or international, they have the obligation to sell electric cars. They have quotas. So the quotas for last year was 14%. And uh, for this year, it's 16%. Next year, it will be 18%. And it increases by 2% every year. And if you don't reach, reach these quotas, then you have to pay, to, to pay uh, huge fines. So um, this is really a way to push the electric car. Of course, we can ask the question, uh, uh, the main electricity of China is uh, powered by coal. But, you know, all, I mean, it's really interesting to see how China is taking the, the uh, is addressing the problem 360 degree, degrees and they move forward on many, many, uh, many tracks and in parallel of the use of the electric cars. Of course, the, the collaborative economy has, uh, has boomed up in China and also the, the shared bikes. Me, when I used to live in China, there were no more bikes anymore. and. Uh, some, I mean, it was very rare to see bikes in the city, in many cities, but now you have uh, big, uh, shared bikes everywhere. And uh, it's so huge now that um, they are building some uh, 
bicycle highways on the model of Denmark. And uh, most of the Chinese uh, cities are now building these highways. You have one uh, of uh, 50 kilometers long in Beijing. Uh, Chengdu, it will be more than 100 kilometers. And uh, I mean, and, and this is kind of uh, an obligation to, to participate, to, to, to have a softer mobility in the cities. And it's, you have also, and that will be my last one because uh, I don't want to take too much time, but just to take about companies, um, because I just mentioned the automotive sector, you have uh, Xiaomi. I mean, most of you probably know these uh, this manufacturers of um, smartphone. They are now building electric cars. When you are a company, a successful company, you have a kind of obligation to participate to this, what I'm, we call uh, an ecological transition. I mean, all the companies have to, to demonstrate to the government that they are part of this movement. And Hanergy, which is a multinational uh, selling uh, solar sales all over the world, they have now launched three models of car. It's solo cars, and so they put sales on the roof and on the rear and front uh, bonnets and uh, that it can um, six hours of sunlight provide 80 kilometers of autonomy without using the electric um, engine so um, you know this is I mean there is plenty of example uh, like this that these companies uh, are participating to the change even if it's not in their sector they are using their innovation and they are showing how they can be part of it um, so now, of course, uh, there is a lot of more uh, point that I could share with you, showing that probably China is uh, walking the talk. Will it be sufficient? That's another point. But uh, uh, okay, at, at, at least they're part of it. And also, I cannot mention it now uh, because I, uh, we don't have enough time. But really, civil society is really part of it, and this is what it, it's. Uh, it can give a kind of optimism, saying that, of course, any country, including China, is part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. So from there, sell upcycling of used clothes. I mean, this is something very interesting. Could you just uh, let us know what, have, what kind of fascinating work are you doing on that? Um, thank you. Uh, nice to meet everyone. My name is uh, Uso Kufiga. I'm an artist from Ghana. Um, Okay, I haven't been to China, so let's get back to Paris. <laughs> um, what I would like to touch on is um, something that has more to do with fashion because my studio uh, repurposes and upcycles um, post-consumer materials into reusable, rewearable um, materials like what I'm wearing. And uh, my interest is about community people and what sustainability actually means and who falls into the work of sustainability when we mention stakeholders. I'm interested in the work that um, people do in Ghana. Ghana, um, Accra is the capital of Ghana and unfortunately Accra receives close to 15 million used garments every week from Europe. And the work that people do in open market spaces to turn some of these things into reusable materials is about, it just turns close to about 10 to 20% of these materials and 80% of them just goes to landfills. So when we meet in such conversations and conferences and we are talking about um, sustainability, my question is about what sustainability is and what the role that it plays or hero, hero plays in um, making sure that some of these materials don't leave their borders and their shores to different parts of the world where it becomes um, um, a burden to other spaces. One of the questions that I like to ask all the time is how is fashion creating a very healthy um, ecosystem that ends up enforcing a very um, healthy ecological well-being for for other parts of the world. So my work for me is something that may be not very innovative at this point, but it also contributes to what sustainability is. And I'm interested in um, how to turn some of these things into different different materials, and some of, how these, some of these materials can also um, upgrade into something more practical and. Uh, and, and usable. That is why I'm excited about a product like this. 
because it moves it moves from what the physical material is to something that is more usable in different uh, different ways and different dimensions and it's 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 i think it's more exciting and more uh, interesting to look at my focus and interest is more about how fashion as a very expressive art form has become very toxic and the role that a toxicity plays affects people who are who actually does don't do so much work about it so i'm interested in how europe and all these in innovative um, conversations are going to turn the sustainability conversation into more action based and more practical based so i'm more on the panel to also listen share and then ask questions <laughs> so thank you very much and um now to Genevieve, uh, I mean, again, we are moving back into this notion of, as what Bertrand said about EFG, and you've been working with, um, you know, Kasabi on territorial circular economy, and also you have been on various boards of looking into sustainable development. So what is your take on that, and what's the current discourse, of the, what is the, the noise and the voice these mm -hmm. days going on around that? Thank you, thank you very much. The good thing of being the last to speak, it's going to be short, because Bertrand already spoiled almost everything I wanted to say. It. And he do it so brightly, so I'm hardly I could expect to repeat what you said. But I will try my best. The only credit I, am, I think I have to be here is maybe because I wrote a book, which in French is uh, Le Crépuscule Fossile, which has been translated in Chinese. So it's maybe for this that I am well, I think I am a good friend of Valérie as well, and I couldn't, uh, Valérie Terranova, and it was hard to, to, to decline the invitation to be part of the panel. But um, more seriously, uh, I think that my, my mood would be, uh, because I have been in this business since uh, the um, Rio summit in 92, so I was very young. I was, with, <laughs> I was working in the United Nation at that time. And I would say that um, this was a golden age of the public diplomacy. 92 was the third Earth Summit. It was the third, and it was a sort of acme, in a sense that um, in French we could say an état de grâce. Um, we have a sort of a convergence of uh, public interest, private interest, investors, NGOs. And, um, and it was the time of the conventions on the climate change that has been adopted. It has been adopted for signature, and all the COP and the following COP are the very beginning is uh, in '92. And at this stage, uh, at this time, we were full of hope because we were convinced that it was possible to curb the greenhouse gases um, inflation, and that we will provide all the solution we needed because we have faith in technology, faith in the government, faith in the youth. I would say that 30 years later. I don't know what we have done with this magical moment. And I think that we have, um, I would say, stop pretending. Maybe it's time to stop pretending. And um, you say when there is another expression in French, which is say, bali mask, which is uh, put the mask off. And it's exactly what's going on. And what you said, Bertrand, um, the masks are coming off in a sense that because ESG is becoming a true political uh, signal, marker, um, people are just uh, adopting um, a very, um, I would say, um, strong position in favor or against. And when you say Texas, we say, uh, go to hell if you have ESG, environment, social governance, uh, business oriented, or California, we say, welcome. That's exactly the, 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 wh where the world is in a sense that now there is true believers <laughs> and there are op op strong opposition as well because why there is a so strong opposition? It's because it's money time. No, it's really money time. Clock is ticking. We know that we have, a little, we have only two decades to curb the greenhouse gas um, and it, to decrease uh, the production of greenhouse gases. And I just want to remind you something, some figures which hasn't been said. And you, you said also the same for the youth. Thank you for mentioning it. Um, we, we have two decades which are really crucial. And uh, we have to today 
Um, we know that if we want to respect our carbon budget, uh, we have to reduce our carbon footprint average per person per, per year uh, and uh, on the average on the world around 3.2 or 3.3. The average today is more like 6, it's almost 7. Okay, So we have just to increase from 50, more than 50. We know that there was huge discrepancies with the uh, carbon footprint. In North America, it's rather 10, it's more than 10 ton per person per year. Um, in, in, East, uh, so in, um, in uh, East Asia, it's almost, it's almost nine, uh, it's increasing. In South Asia, it's, of course, it's very less, it's not only three. In, in Africa, it's not, it's not two. And in, in, in France, for example, we are the average is above 10. So just to figure out that what we have to do is not a transition, and you're absolutely right, it's not a transition, it's a radical revolution of all our habits in terms of consuming, producing, uh, traveling, and, 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 and there is absolutely, uh, and the toolbox is just empty. I think it's better to say it's empty, even though there was very inspiring, um, inspiring movement in toward uh, circular economy. There was also hope in in the way China. That's right. China is really tackled the problem very seriously because I think that they understand that there will not there won't be prosperity if there is not an ecological transition. Just because it's just game over, and uh, it's something which is. Interesting to compare with uh, how China has tackled the problem in terms of uh, is this way and there is not another way, besides the fact that all the electrical transition is powered by coal right now. So, but, even say that, uh, it, I think it's just because there is no other way. In Europe, we are discussing forever, and United States are just on the verge of the civil war. And I think that in other countries, it's not another business. So um, I would say that for my, my part, the, all which has been done in, on ESG in finance or in corporate social responsibility is not very well um, installed in the business. But it's more, uh, my concern is more how we are going to accelerate. Because now it's really, as I said, clock is ticking. Uh, we know everything we should know about uh, the ecological disaster, the biodiversity uh, catalyst, and we we are uh, above a sum of, of knowing that we should now act. And uh, I will finish by this. I, I see in my in my business in, uh, with investors on our big company, and even when you, Bertrand, you talk about accounting, how we if we create a, a different kind of value, how can we we credit uh, the people or company who are acting in favor of this new creation of value, more ecological, more human human oriented? How do you can get credit for what you say, what you do? Because this, this is impossible. It, the notion of impact is very qualitative and is very subjective. So, and um, and I was I was just uh, I was just uh, arriving to this idea that I don't know if I'm going to translate it in English right, but uh, how long it would be too too soon to know if it's too far, something like that, you know. Uh, and to say, oh, we, we have to work on it, we have to produce other studies. Uh, wha uh, what are the two figures after the coma? But we don't care about the two figures after the coma. We know that, the sol we, know that we have to, to go in this direction. And um, that's why I think that cooperation is absolutely crucial, and cooperation with Asia and with Africa. And all the transfer on technology that we can provide those countries with is absolutely crucial because mainly those people living in this continent are above the emission, uh, the, the level of emission we, we, we should be allowed to do. And we, we have to help them to have a decent, a decent life. And so we should provide all the solutions we, sh we, we could and try to work on this uh, with reduction of carbon footprint together because otherwise it would be just public and private agenda. But if it just uh, go first and I will follow, it won't work. So I'm sorry to be a little bit uh, pessimistic, but I have still faith in um, the wonderful uh, capacity of human being to maybe uh, find solution, a big constraint and big value. Normally, it's a new civilization waiting for. 
Thank you. Thank you, Genevieve. I mean, um, before I maybe throw some points here and there, I just want to maybe have my two insights about sustainability. I teach a little bit about that at business school, and I think um, uh, there is this debate in sustainability, you know, which is about, yes, you need to have conscious consumerism, but what about billions of people who have not yet went to that evolutionary path of consumerism, particularly people at the bottom of the pyramid? You know, 65% of the world still lives at less than $10 a day below consuming class. So, uh, of course, we need sustainable and responsible consumerism, uh, but what about people who have not yet tasted, uh, you know, consumerism in, in large parts of the world. And by the way, in my own country, India and China, these two countries, in spite of their economic development, 40% of the world poor live in these two countries. And, and that's a big amount of people. Uh, and, and what do we do about that? So yes, consumerism, sustainability, consciousness is okay, but you put technology, you put implementation, you put regulations, uh, but then who ultimately pays for that? It's the people. And then affordability comes into question. So uh, that is one thing, and, and I was looking at one of the COP reports that if Indians and Chinese, just these two part of the world, people in India and China just start living the way we live in the Western world, just exactly the same way, not better because they're aspirational, just the way we live here, we need one whole planet Earth as raw material, just for these two countries. So the problem is, as what you said, and Bertrand, you know, how do we measure it, how do we execute it, and all that. But then building on that, I just throw this point to um, Rina and, um, and, um, and Cell, you know, consumerism is there, but then this notion of recycling, circular economy, upcycling, how do we tackle that, you know, uh, particularly making it more affordable and more, you know, scaling up in that sense? So, so any, any takes on that, if you'd like to give? Um, I think for the... F we, we probably have to start looking at secularity from a different perspective. And uh, secularity is, it has been in many quarters a very practical um, um, ritual. Um, um, taking, let me take fashion for example. In Ghana, we have a system where you inherit things that you wear from your uncles, your grandparents, your parents, and all that. I'm, I'm sure it's almost the same in different parts. And for me, growing up seeing some of these things, that was my understanding of how a secular economy runs. You, There is a way where you know that there isn't so much being produced. So what what is at your reach is the resources that you have available to you, and that is why you can reach and make use of. So there isn't a vast production or a mass production to how things move around. I am thinking about how we can adapt such a system and reintroduce it into this new system that we have now and how that can end up including everyone on a more sustainable level. Yeah, um, and looking at res recycling or upcycling. Recycling, for example, if, if a product like this is made from used clothes or used materials, and after you using them, can take it back to the producer, and the producer can make something else out of it. I think it's it's it may be not the best, but it's one of the possible ways to relook really at circularity. And I think that is what I can I can say for it for now. Raina, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah, these. It depends, um, yeah, it depends on really on how you see it, actually. But uh, um, it is actually a problem. Like, when you think of sustainability, um, there is a high pricing for it. And for the low pricing, um, the, this is honestly a challenge. And for example, like uh, these products that we, when we upcycle, it is costly too. But at the same time, the, uh, the clothing that we cannot, for example, upcycle, it all goes to trash. And uh, there's, there's some products that we can, it can upcycle and there's some products that cannot be upcycled. And it will be, for example, sent to Ghana. 
and uh, we think uh, for uh, we think it's helping the world but actually we're not and um, yeah these gar garbage or let's say waste um, once we throw it away it goes to the landfills and uh, it, it doesn't e even get burnt because that's also costly too and then that's stuck in the land there and uh, this is the biggest uh, one of the problem because um, I know, for example, like every every second, uh, a ton full, full of truck is uh, going to be wasted. And this we don't actually even know about it. Although, and then we're wearing clothes, and uh, this piles up every time. And uh, yeah, this is the biggest challenge that we have because this board, for example, we are using the the, the waste that is. Uh, let's say the waste that is uh, unsold, uh, I mean, the overproduction. So it's not even worn, but there's a like a massive, uh, uh, massive waste that is worn just like four or six times per year, and then it's just sent to landfills. And uh, this this is a total different uh, uh, scope, I think. Yeah. Very interesting. So yeah, of course, this one issue is about regulations and how this is implemented. So maybe Ashok and Bertrand, you can just chip in on that. I mean, you talk about marine biodiversity and, and you know, uh, all that. So yes, there is this expectation, but in reality, is this being put into action? And what are the, the thorny points in that which, are, which are, could be a problem? Probably maybe Bertan can also talk about it from a corporate perspective. I didn't speak very much about uh, ma marine uh, biodiversity, but I just wanted to to uh, bounce on what you said about cooperation. Uh, and if I'm back since two years now in, in the public service, is, is I believe that this world that we and the challenges we are living uh, today, of course, solutions can come only from civil society. Solutions can, can, can come only from uh, uh, the youth, only from the uh, enterprises, I mean, that's what we believe. But if it's not endorsed by countries, if it's not endorsed by um, regional uh, corporations uh, and by the UN, I think there's still power in the UN, although it's at stake, the influence of the UN, as we know. Uh, I believe that what we need is a shock of cooperation in front of the clash of civilization that was mentioned uh, this, this, this morning. And uh, it's the situation which engages us. And I, I do believe really, uh, and this is not only addressed to Axel Creu, I do believe really in the, the necessity for the governments to endorse uh, solutions and to work towards more cooperation. Uh, and that can be uh, illustrated uh, by marine diversity uh, coalitions. There's this high mission coalition for nature and people that France and Costa Rica created in 2018 in one of the One Planet summits that at the initiative of President Macron was organized in um, Kenya. Yes, that was the Kenya one, um, which is striving for uh, and defending this target of 30 by 30. In 2030, have 30% of earth and seas uh, protected, the, the barren protected areas, which is not so easy because you need the, the countries and the governments to endorse, uh, and then you have to finance. And today what we are doing with uh, a number of, of partners is to create a real secretariat for this uh, high ambition question, 30 by 30, and raising funds basically from the philanthropic uh, world of companies. And what are we trying to and that's what we're, we're going to do in Egypt for, as far as the ocean is concerned and different activities, is really put science at the center, to have science decision making. So uh, one, to respond to what you said, shock of cooperation, government endorsement, concrete projects with concrete deliveries to, to the citizens, to the people, nature and people, uh, and you need money, and, but you need money, but it has to be uh, science governed. Uh, so we have to work with more, uh, as far as ocean is concerned, ocean literacy and investment in science, in oceanographic science. But this is what I'm saying for, for the ocean is, of course, uh, for every, uh, I would say, environmental science, uh, earth, the air, and uh, biodiversity. Uh, and I, I really believe that uh, these coalitions 
uh, multi-sector, multi-actor is not what you usually do even in governments. You have, you have silos, right? Uh, it's only the diplomats who actually work 360 degree in the interministériel or, or with, with other partners. Uh, we have to work, and I think that that starts also. Uh, there's not a lot of students this morning. There were more students at the, at the university level uh, for this way of educating to environment solutions, which can only be uh, transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, uh, and that that is also something which is very much uh, at stake. And it's the chance that we have because we're facing these huge challenges, the only action we can do as far as where we are, uh, I don't know, for, for your own world, is to reframe, ref reset uh, the framing of uh, public action. Okay, Bertrand, anything you'd like to add on that or yeah, another I perspective? I just don't know what you mean when you discuss cooperation and then you throw at me your own world. <laughs> I, th I think it's, it's a very weird thing. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm half joking and half serious because this is precisely our problem. Uh, and that's what I've seen. Uh, I've spent most of my life moving from one silo to another. I've spent most of my life participating to panels where people say we need to improve uh, public-private cooperation, public-private civil society work, etc. And the reality is that we do less and less of that. We have a lot of panels, we have a lot of summits, we are, and I've participated to tons of that. But the reality is that the level of trust has diminished in the world, the level of suspicion has risen, and it's very, very, very difficult to put people around the table. It's uh, un very unfortunate, uh, but the, and again, this is my job, this is my world where I, I'm trying to, to mobilize public and private actors to, to, to finance sustainability. And the reality is that, uh, and again, I, I spent quite a lot of years with the World Bank, for instance, uh, the private sector says the public sector is too low, too slow, too bureaucratic, too corrupt, too whatever. It's not working. And then the public sector is very nervous because whenever, and I've got a precise example in mind, when they work with the private sector, they say, yeah, we are, we are providing support to the private sector, and then we run conflict of interest. We are, so it's very difficult. So th there is this uh, objective 17 of the SDG, which is about cooperation. I think it's absolutely crucial, cooperation, governance, etc. We all know that. And the reality, let's face it, it's not working. It's not working. Uh, and uh, I, I am, again, I'm a, I'm a pro-market uh, economy guy. Uh, I believe market economy is probably the best system we have found to allocate uh, resources under constraints. Uh, but we have to discuss the constraints, and that's precisely the point. And for me, it's, it's like water. I mean, market economy is like water. If you let it go, it will find the easiest way, the fastest path, like water. It, sh it just shoots and it goes. If you put the right constraints, like water, you can channel the market economy. You can drive it in the right direction. People will be not happy. They will, yeah, but at the end of the day, they follow. And that's what we've been doing for 200 years. I mean, we've, we've made, at some moment, we've made good decisions, which were tough. I mean, the lobby say it's not good, etc. And then it's okay. People, yeah, and they adapt. And so I think the two, the two, I would say the two walls that we can build to channel market economy. One is obviously when you're French, you think about tax and regulation, which is true. Tax and regulation are part of the equation. It's not the only part, but it's part of the equation. So we have to to say what is allowed, what is not allowed, what is recommended, etc. And we have to be very clear. But it's taking time. We can't wait everything from the government. We can't wait everything from UN discussion, except because it's not the way it's working. So we need to have this signal, and I think it's important. But there, there is another world, and the other world is all of us. All of us as consumers, all of us as producers, all of us are, 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 are talent, because it's a new name now, all of us in our various capacities. And let's face it, it's very difficult. We are all schizophrenic with these issues. I'm being insulted by my kids whenever I take a plane, and I know I feel bad. But, but the reality when, I, I remember when I spoke with Paul Polman, who has been one of the first to invest in my company, he was the CEO of Unilever. He's one of the guys that tried to change the course of Unilever. I said, why did you do that? He said, well, first, these were my convictions. But second, nobody wanted to work in a company which basically was producing ice cream with weird colorants and which was putting uh, dirty uh, soap in, in rivers. So if I want to attract people, I want to be bad. So that's a pressure. If, if, if the students are consistent, say, I don't want to work in a company that sucks, Nah, that's a message to the company. If the investors do the same and we're not there yet, that's also a message. And if the consumers stop buying, so we, we have this capacity, but we, we cannot fool ourselves. There will not be somebody who says, this is it. It's not going to happen this way. Uh, as Geneviève said, in the US, it will be decided in court. 
today you have 1,500 companies which are being sued for being too climate activists and 1,500 which are being sued for inaction. So we have to wait until the Supreme Court made a decision. Based on the composition of the Supreme Court, you might guess that decision. It might take several years. So nothing will come out of the US. There might be an interesting initiative. Nothing will come. The EU, as we say, the risk is something which is very complex. I don't want to say bureaucratic, but that's a possibility. China is an interesting character. But cooperation with China is, I mean, I was not there this morning, but I suppose you discuss that. Everybody wants to cooperate, but it's not that easy those days. So the, the picture is not great. And then how do we engage with Africa, Latin America, and Asia? And that's where we have to be truly inclusive. Because the reality is that I don't want the EU to become Boboland. You know, we, we, we've discovered the reality of what we need. We've discovered a new economy, and then we turn to Africa, Latin America, and hey, guys, we found the light. It doesn't work this way. But that, that's the risk. And I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Again, I mentioned the natural gas issues. I mean, there are plenty. I'm sure you, all of us have experienced this. Absolutely. And I think unless the problem comes to your back door, you, you, you really then come to look into it. Uh, Genevieve and maybe Natalie can chip in uh, with some thoughts about these issues. I think uh, you, talk, you talked about you know, the consumers being very conscious in China towards uh, sustainability and all this kind of consumerism response. Probably part of it, yeah, not all of it. it. Like so, in any country, you have a part mm -hmm. of the population who is uh, really worried and who would like to be part of it. And I think, of course, uh, probably the way a uh, change of uh, the way of life we are having just uh, me i come from the communication and advertisement industry and um, we made believe to the consumers that just to buy things and to own uh, is a promise of uh, happiness and it doesn't work not only it work it doesn't work but also it just damages the planet so i think maybe we should address this and just say okay just make the experience, not uh, consuming and not producing so much, and just see. And me, I had so many speakers on stage just sharing uh, how they change the way of life and how it brings happiness in their life. And we always forget about that, just mentioning that sharing moment, just, you know, just take a more time in nature. It seems just maybe silly or just, but it, it brings so much uh, more happiness than just be just uh, stick in this consumption world, just wanted to consume more, and all these uh, companies, advertisement, pushing, pushing. Now with nice stories, green stories, you know, just like, uh, okay, we just produce as much waste, but at least we recycle. Why don't we stop producing waste? Why don't we try to just cut down the way we, we produce things? So I think maybe we should just, uh, as you said, maybe, yeah, it's not a transition, it's a revolution, it's a change of paradigm. We should give up this paradigm and just make uh, give birth to another one. But this is a ch such a challenge. And I think it's like a thrust that we need to push upon, you know, like the COVID. We were forced to change. We were forced to adapt, and you know, and 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 and, and therefore we need some kind of this uh, a certain shock and jerk and uh, effect, you know, so that the society moves into a different trajectory towards sustainability. Genevieve, any thoughts on that? And then we maybe open it up for the. Uh, audience very quickly I think we are all scared because it's very difficult to imagine something which are not the current growth and unlimited growth uh, we are scared because if we speak about degrowth both all everybody is crying it's crazy it's no sense um, on the uh, and another the growth like we are living it it's a very short event in the scale of humanity it's really we, we, we we are in a very strange position because it started with the industrial revolution and uh, with the freedom of incorporation. And, and, and I agree with, uh, with Bertrand, it, it brought a lot of wonderful things. But now the question is that we are, we are touching, physically touching limits, our own body, the planetary limits. Um, and then how do we deal with this, this idea of limits? It's not part of your imagination. So we have not we have not st good stories about it and we can refer to. Um, the only stories we, we, we like we refer to are science fiction and going to Mars. So it, it's something we have to reinvent inside boundaries, but we hate boundaries. It's, it's a limit. It means that it's attrition, that we are losing something, but maybe we are not losing something. Maybe it would be much more in terms of happiness and cooperation, but, and then, but we are very scared so 
what we're doing is just pretending. And we are pretending, exactly as you say, Natalie, um, keep consuming and we'll take care of recycling. But it, 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 it's not true. When you looked at some uh, a big corporation who are putting plastic bottles, it's billions of plastic bottles in, in the ocean and all everywhere on Earth. If they have a, a, just a, the slightest sense of corporate social responsibility, if you install a factory producing plastic bottles, at least you take care of the reverse logistic, or you invest uh, in uh, in recycling plastic. You have you are compelled to do it when you're in Europe because there are more strict, very, very strict conditions in producing plastic from recycling uh, uh, material. But when you're in Africa or in India, what is your corporate responsibility about doing this? You think that the informal economy will take care of it, and I think it's it's just the limit of it, you know. So all the big companies are fully aware; they are completely fully aware what are the risks but just they are completely scared about making a big path in, because it just, <laughs> it just, we don't know. We don't know, we have never experienced this. And we are all tied together, market, private, public, <laughs> and consumer. But the youth are really willing to change this, but they are really frightened. And they don't want to be part of this world. And, uh, I, for my part, it's, 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 the figure you announced is that 45, 46% of the youth, what well, this is in France, in, in Europe, in 10 countries in Europe, from 16 to 25 years old, they think that the future is just frightening. It's not uh, worrying about it or it's not, mm, I don't feel good. It's just frightening. Are you really hearing this? And are we going to be good ancestors? I'm not sure that we are going to be good ancestors. I'm go I think that we are going to be the worst ancestors in all the human history. Not a very rosy picture, I guess, but that's how it is. I mean, so I think what we can do is that we can let it up to the audience. If we can have a... Uh, you can yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, just uh, uh, three questions. Could you list me a... a a few names which are been inspiring to you, just a few names really inspiring to you. There may be a few names of people who are really moving the needle, so maybe less inspiring, but at least they are great at action. And then maybe give us an example of programs that you see that are inspiring the young generation to act. As you said, it's uh, part of the responsibility will be with the civil society and the young generation. So did you see any specific program which then would need to be leveraged and, and demultiplied because they are just great? Maybe I can mention the name of an entrepreneur who retired very recently, Ivan Schwina, who is the head of Patagonia. And uh, it was very interesting when he was doing his uh, advertisement campaign during the black market, which is the biggest day of uh, sales. He, he, I remember in New York, there was, he, he had this iconic model of a sweater, and it was written, don't buy this jacket if you don't need it. And uh, the way now he, 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 he created an NGO to, to, to get, I mean, to, to take care of this company because now he's retired because he said there is no financial way or, uh, or reliable solutions that I'm sure that they will follow the line that I, I built all this year. So that's, to me, it is one of the inspiring people uh, I have in mind. Um, yeah, and he is a benefit corporation. He is, a, and, um, I would say there's plenty of inspiring uh, things. The problem is the scale up. But I have in mind, uh, maybe you know this uh, young fellow, which is Corentin de Châtel Perron. He's a French young man, and what he's built is was a, the the NASA of low tech. It's not the NASA to send a, send the airship in, in the space, but it's low tech. So low tech is very interesting. Um, because it's just uh, good sense and um, engineering skills, engineering skills and um, observation of the nature. And what is done is very inspiring for the youth. Uh, beside that, uh, beside that, there is no, I would say, juicy business model behind, and it's open sources. 
but it's very inspiring, Corentin de Chatel Perron. And there is some uh, on Arte now, also TV channel. Uh, he has been doing the, uh, he's touring the world uh, in, uh, on a boat and uh, he do some stops in uh, each continent and try to, to make a sort of encyclopedia <laughs> of uh, the low tech uh, in each continent and countries, inspiring the youth and um, maybe one of the, the new generation we, we need. But how we convert this is money. That's the point. No, I think, first of all, uh, I want to pay tribute to Geneviève, which has been a source of inspiration to me. No, oh, that's true. And, uh, no, no, I'm serious. I mean, she, she, she is very modest, but she's been one of the pioneers. I mean, in 1992, she was very young, but then she created her own business here, etc. I followed this closely, and uh, she was one of the first to really uh, understand it was about systemic change, not just marginal change. So I think it's important. And among my heroes, I have two categories. The one I'm financing with my business, which are really entrepreneurs in difficult countries, which are really tackling the biggest issues and uh, and making money. I mean, it's uh, I'm, I'm not in the humanitarian business. I'm in the business, and we are making good money while having a good impact. I'm trying to repeat because most people tend to be, yeah, Bertrand is doing these nice things in the developing countries, he's not making money. No, 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 you can make money and have it all. And we are really working with entrepreneurs. On the other hand, I'm also very interested by the people which are working on doing the boring stuff, which is how do you change accounting, compensation policies, all these things which are not very glamorous, uh, but which at the, end, at the end of the day will make a difference. Uh, so, uh, for instance, I mean, uh, I, I'm biased, but uh, as part of the investors that, that pushed me to create Blue Like and Orange, you had two guys which have been very, uh, or three actually, which have been very inspiring in that matter. One is Emmanuel Faber, I mean, he's known in France, the former CEO of Danone, somewhat controversial for many, but he chose, after leaving Danone, to, to lead the IFRS ISSB. So the, the, the IFRS is a, the foundation that works on accounting standards, and now he's working on the non-accounting standards. I know there are disputes with the EU, etc. But at the end of the day, he has chosen to, to spend his time working on standards. He was a CEO of a large company, and now he's working on this stuff, and it's not fun. So, I'm, I'm, but this this might have a bigger influence than any companies. Uh, Paul Polman, which I already mentioned, which, which is leading a number of the UN work with the Global Compact, etc. I think it's very important to uh, to have these. Uh, uh, th these voices, and uh, and of course some academics. So there are a number of people which are really uh, uh, chartering these things. We we don't lose pioneers. We don't miss pioneers. We, we we miss now the traction to get to the next stage. I think in 2015 we have relied too much on pioneers. We are very happy that you had some figures that you can show everywhere. And say, yes, look at that, it's happening. But now you turn and say, oh my God, who is behind? And that's really where we need the crowds and we need to, to, uh, to pull the traction with a, with a younger generation. I, I, I would like to, uh, to, to, to give some names. Uh, so I won't say Emmanuel Macron because you won't believe me. You'll think you'll suspect me for conflict of interest. But, but follow what he has been doing with the One Planet uh, Summit, which tries to respond to that with, with many countries, not just uh, as France and with the EU. The EU, I think, can be uh, should be, and that's why we have still hope, uh, could be an exemplary uh, region. Uh, and I know that Emmanuel Faber is working and having fights with the EU, but it's a democracy uh, fight, a uh, democratic fight to, to impose those standards. And I think I was going to say Emmanuel Faber as well. I met him this summer uh, in, in, in Geneva. Uh, just a name that you should, you should know, you spoke about youth. There's this young girl, a lady, she's uh, less than 30 years old, she might be 28, her name is Daniela V. Fernandez. She's an Hispanic uh, from Equator. Uh, she was in the States and she's now settling uh, in France. And she has created this NGO called Sustainable Ocean Alliance, uh, which has just now raised in Lisbon $15 million. In the next three years, she's going to raise like $100 million. That's her target to give grants to young ocean professionals wanting to engage in uh, training in, uh, in, in concrete action. Uh, and she's also financing 
uh, young start I mean young professionals in startups coming up with very innovative tech solutions for for the ocean so that youth we uh, begin by talking about the same at the same time maybe the other 50% is, is trying to find solutions within the, within our world uh, I think Greta Thunberg was important but I think that people like Daniela are even more important because they're coming with solutions and within our world uh, and with uh, with the ways that 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 we have been uh, working with that means public and private uh, financing of systems and and and, and in an economy in a uh, of uh, an economy de marché, uh, a market economy. Um, so, and the last thing I would like to say uh, is follow what Barack Obama is just now doing. He just now won an Emmy Award for his documentary on national parks. So uh, that's quite interesting to see how a leader uh, is doing his own transition. Uh, and I'm not sure it's just because there's a créneau uh, to be taken. I think that, that uh, these are leaders, and I'm talking about him as a, as a leader, as a personality, of course not a, as a, head of, a former head of state. Uh, but this, this domain, I mean, that gives me hope uh, that, that leaders like Barack Obama are investing time and energy uh, in this uh, sustainability uh, issue. Al Gore, of course. Yes, sir. Uh, hello, uh, nice to meet you and thank you so much for this intervention. Uh, it was very interesting to learn more about your perspective on that. Uh, I wanted to step in because I happen to be a French 25 year old a person who studied geography and climatology and I'm quite uh, hopeless. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm part of the statistic. Um, I'm not hopeless for the whole future because I feel like there is joy and love to be found uh, even in the, in the darkest times. However, I'm quite hopeless in um, um, in the sense that I don't feel like we are able to tackle the subject of climate change as efficiently and as strongly as this situation needs to be taken, like with the, with the tools that the consumer society leave to us. And um, actually, I just wanted to, to, uh, to react on a couple of things that I've heard, and I think they were very insightful. For instance, when you mentioned like the emissions per person, you know, it's a it's a statistic that I've heard often, you know, at the university uh, also. And uh, to me, it's quite uh, eerie because you know it feels like uh, going to the restaurant, you know, with people that are richer than you. And you know they kind of uh, I'm kind of buying just a meal because you know uh, it's the end of the month and I'm not so rich. And the people at my table, you know, they are going to buy maybe a pastis uh, and then uh, appetizers and uh, perhaps a dessert and everything. And at the end, they're like, okay, so we split the bill. I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> did not expect that. Even if I had a delightful time with you guys, <laughs> so it's kind of um, it's uh, always to me a little eerie, you know, to be in this position and to. Uh, and to have to uh, do something, you know, after hearing this kind of uh, statistics, because, uh, well, it's difficult to feel like it's a shared responsibility when, in fact, some people do have a bigger, bigger share of their uh, of responsibility in this uh, conflict. And so my question, to put it simply, would be, uh, I am quite hopeless uh, in, uh, in this situation, and I was wondering if you were awful uh, on your end, and if you know, you can think of ways to address that and to convince perhaps that growth is actually something that is going to be difficult when addressing ecological uh, subjects and that perhaps some people are going to have less money, less incomes or less comforts, you know, in their daily lives and it's going to be necessary, you know, to tackle this problem. So, yeah, I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's quite chaotic, but... Uh, no, I, I'm not hopeless, and I don't want you to leave this room being hopeless. Uh, I, I think we have to be realistic. It's a tough moment uh, for all the reasons we've been describing. But at the same time, uh, COVID is an interesting case, because when we were hitting the wall, we've been capable of reacting. We've made a number of mistakes. In particular, we did not really support uh, emerging and developing economies. We've been quite selfish. But still, we've been able to find a vaccine in nine months. We've been able uh, to mobilize trillions of dollars. We've been able to do things that were unheard of. So when you hit the wall, you can get it. The, the big problem, uh, as is, has been discussed by a number of economists, with, with in particular climate, but it's true with most of the challenges we are facing, is that we are at the crossroads of the what Mark Carney calls the tragedy of the horizon, because we are not there yet, and the tragedy of the commons, which is very well known in economy. Uh, and, and, and so I believe that when, the, when we pass the tipping point, when people realize that here we are, and I don't think we are there yet, 
But when we pass this tipping point, we, we, never had, we, ne we, we never have that much people searching. We've never had that many technologies available. We've never had that much money available. We, I mean, when you look at the history of mankind, we got everything we need to address the issue. Sorry? Yeah, but, uh, yeah, but we are where we are, and we started late, etc. But, but my, my point is that the, it's true that at the end of the day, we might probably need to to to, uh, to choose to, to mix a little bit of adaptation mitigation. I don't want to enter into the details, but to be to be hopeful, I think again, we we never had that many people thinking about it. We never had. I mean, we can't say we don't know it, etc. So maybe the minute we touch the wall, we will react. I, I know it's not great, uh, but we got all the pieces of the puzzle. We've got all of them. We don't need anything else. We just need to put the puzzle together. So that's why, it's, again, it seems that during COVID, we are stuck at home, so a lot of us need puzzles. So maybe we have more training now, so we should, we should start working on this puzzle. But I think we get it. Well, it doesn't look like, but I, I am not hopeless. Um, I have my motto, my personal motto is, it's too late to be pessimistic. So we don't have any choice. We have to be committed. And if we are not committed, it would be denial, frustration, um, resent re resentment, resentless, resent resentment. So very bad vibes. So if we, if we want to share good vibes together, uh, we, we have no other choice than to be committed. And <laughs> it's too far. It's too soon to know if it's too far. You're right, Bertrand. It's already too far. So we are eating the wall, but some are not going to, uh, doesn't seem to know it. And what you say remind me a, a very nice drawing from Xavier Gors, which is a French um, uh, drawer. Um, there is a family at a restaurant. Uh, there are four adults, and there is a baby in a baby seat. And the four adults uh, say to the waiter, oh, we are going to have four gastronomic meals, and the bill would be for the little one. <laughs> and it's exactly what's happening. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to touch on the hope thing. Um, I'm not hopeless, but being hopeful can also be very depressing and traumatic sometimes because we are dealing with power structures who also find it intimidating, as she mentioned, intimidating to see that there is some sort of progress. There is advertising, there is media, there are all these powerful, you know, players at play who when they see that there is something good going to, going to happen at some point, they will try and try to make it, you know, go to, go to the wrong side. So I think as humans as we are, we can try as much as we can to remain hopeful. And that is where all these interesting ideas can come up and we can come up with something exciting. And I wanted to also touch on the question that you asked earlier about um, um, inspiration or things like that. Um, I like all the names that were mentioned, but I would like to say people who inspire me a lot are factory workers from different parts of the world, Bangladesh, Vietnam, who actually do the actual work on what we are all sitting down here wearing. And they have to fight all the time to make sure all the low wages that they are received are paid to them and they deserve what to be paid to them. So. I admire their strength and how they fight against this sort of oppression and exploitation and in, in how um, this very rich fashion industry accumulates a lot of money but don't pay all these people the money that they deserve. So they inspire me a lot. Thank you. Great. We can take maybe one more question. Yes, um, thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah, I'm also a student uh, and I also happen to be French. Um, and last year, I think, or the, the year before, I had a class with Olivier de Schutter, um, the representative of uh, extreme poverty at the UN. And we talked a lot about the global compact. And there's one word I haven't heard uh, in this panel yet it's accountability. And we, we have heard of accounting, but not accountability yet. So my question would be as long as it's cheaper to build new things rather than to recycle, and as long as the majority of the people on this planet cannot afford sustainable products. Can we achieve sustainability without constraint on the private sector and especially the huge actors? Because it's very hard to be a new actor right now. We have to act on the actors that are already here and taking up the huge majority of the market. Let's be serious. Um, so I am convinced that you are uh, great people trying to make a difference. But how can we address those people who think that going on Mars is a realistic target or that? 
eternal life is what we should be aiming for right now. Um, yeah, so how can we actually change the paradigm and the system? And thanks a lot for all these interesting uh, talks, especially on fashion, yeah, um, and how to, like, I think we've already produced enough clothes for the rest of human existence, <laughs> to be honest. So thanks a lot for what you're doing in that specific sector, because that's Thank something I'm really interested into. Well said. Anyone would like to take a final thought on that? I don't think we have the time because that would, yeah. that would need an, uh, another panel to yeah. respond to your questions. I'll just say one word about hope is, and this is my sector now, which is blue economy. Have a look at what's going to happen in blue economy. Uh, there's huge opportunities for job, for economy, uh, and also, again, for uh, uh, a shock of cooperation. That's what I hope. I want to tackle your question because I think it's a crucial one. Um, the, the big issue, as I said, there is no master of the world. So we, we can say they should do that or we should find a way. It's not going to happen. End of the story. So we should really find other ways to get there. Uh, and one of the other ways, I've been CFO of companies for many years. So I know you can have dreams for two months and 29 days. And the 30th day of the third month, you are back to reality because principles brings you back to what you had to deliver according to the rules. So what, what I'm, the, the real questions you're asking is about the price and the constraints. Uh, and people say, yeah, but you know, you have to be profitable, etc." I say, okay, what is profit? Ask your kids what is profit, so they will come to the grocery accounting, they say it's revenues minus cost. I've been CFO, there are hundreds of ways, despite IFRS, to calculate revenue. There are hundreds of ways to calculate cost. So for me, profit is a social norm. The social norm today is particularly favorable to the system you described. There is nothing that prevents us from changing this, this social norm. We have to incorporate in the way we calculate revenues, and cost exactly what we've described today. And this is the best way to enforce things, it's externalities, etc. Today we are paying, we are focusing all our energy and brain cells to discuss financial capital. But the financial capital is the most abundant capital we have on Earth. What is rare, what is scarce, and what, where we should focus our brain cells is environmental capital, social capital, human capital, societal capital, etc. And these things have zero value. So the minute we start to incorporate, that's why all these things which are boring are important. The minute you incorporate, then people will be forced to do that. But I don't see any other way. There, there, again, there is no system in the world that will force big companies to do these things or these things. It's unfortunate. I know when I, being French, when I was the World Bank, people say, hey, you're French, you think you take the best deal and you abolish the privilege and you're done overnight. No, there will be no sustainability grand soir. It's very sad. It's very painful. But this is the way we have to tackle it. So I think you, you point in the right direction, but we have to find ways to get there. And it's, again, boring, no, uneasy, but I believe it's one of the only ways to, to achieve something. Essential, just essential. I mean, uh, we are almost off the time. Thank you very much. And I think just to end that, I mean, we can be hopeless, but I think we have to be hopeful uh, for 4 billion or 3 billion people who are anyway hopeless in their lifestyle and living conditions. So I think there's nothing more down to go, but probably up to go. And so that we reduce the gap between expectation and reality mismatch. Thank you very much for the session. Thank, have a nice day.